a college campus emptied except for its choral scholars. People would put on their robes and gather in the chapel to recapture the spirit of pre-war Christmases at the school. As the clock struck five, the participants processed from their respective robing areas to stand near the south door. A faint musical hum was heard of the choir taking up the note, and then the boys softly began to sing once in Royal David's city while moving eastward. The men joined in the second verse. The service went on. The lectionary gave us the 60th of Isaiah. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, for the first lesson. And the 15th of Revelation, with the sea of glass and the harpers, for the second. The anthem would be, prepare ye the way, or in dolce jubilo. There the bells are ringing, or in regis curia. And at the end of all, there would be two carols, these for choice, like silver lamps in a distant shrine, and a virgin unspotted. And yes, even with Stainer's unregenerate harmony. This was the form of service used on Christmas Eve in the chapel of King's College, Cambridge. An introit hymn and some carols added to the customary evensong. The recollection I just shared with you was written by M.R. James, who served as provost to King's from 1905 to 1918. Apparently, James also told ghost stories by the light of a solitary candle to private and spellbound audiences in various rooms, and apparently that was also part of Christmas at King's. Now, World War I ended in November of 1918, and already the resulting spread of the Spanish flu pandemic was that eventually would globally afflict one-third of the world population was already spreading as soldiers went home. Eric Milner White returned to King's as dean after serving as an army chaplain. Previously, he was an undergraduate student and then later a chaplain as well. And seeking a fresh start, he opted to adapt a service by a colleague for that Christmas Eve service. Now, to know that origin story, we actually need to back up 40 years to trace that history of where that service came from. So if we go to 1880 in the Turo Cathedral, the first bishop at Turo, Edward White Benson, designed a festal service for Christmas Eve. Now the present cathedral was not yet built. There were two foundation stones that were just laid at that time by the Prince of Wales, and services were actually happening in a temporary wooden cathedral. It's almost been described as a wooden shed. Now this wooden shed could hold 400 people. And at 10 p.m. on Christmas Eve in 1880, a new tradition was born. Now the son of Edward White Benson, his name was A.C. Benson, recalled, my father arranged from ancient sources a little service for Christmas Eve nine carols and nine tiny lessons, which were read by various officers of the church, beginning with a chorister and ending through the different grades with a bishop. G.H.S. Walpole, later Bishop of Edinburgh, is credited with having suggested the idea to Bishop Benson. The ancient sources on which Benson drew are not specified, but the monastic office of Matins, with its three groups of three lessons, each followed by a responsory, seems to offer a good model. Now, monastic offices that you may have heard of were daily prayer services practiced in the early church every three hours. Some of the familiar named ones are Lauds or Vespers or Compline. Now, in the time, Part of what was happening was the people were singing and they were spending more time at the pub and less time at church. 
And so they were, the, the choir would actually go out into the community to sing carols. And so the other part of this was, how do we bring people back into church for Christmas Eve? And so we have a couple newspaper articles from the West Britain. This is a newspaper in Cornwall where the Toro community is. And they describe the new carol service with this announcement. The choir of the cathedral will sing a number of carols in the cathedral tomorrow evening, Christmas Eve, the service commencing at 10 o'clock. We understand that this is at the wish of many of the leading parishioners and others. A like service has been instituted in other cathedrals in large towns and has been much appreciated. It is the intention of the choir to no longer continue the custom of singing carols at the residences of the members of the congregation. Now, after that event, we're told by the same source that, quote, on Christmas Eve, the carol sang a series of carols under the conductorship of Vicar Coral, the Reverend G.H.S. Walpole, and the organist, Mr. Mitchell. There was a very full congregation, and the service was much enjoyed. Now, one year later, a similar report appeared following the cathedral's annual Christmas Eve service. Quote, On Christmas Eve, a service was held commencing at 10 o'clock. Prayers were intoned by the vicar choral, the Reverend G.H.S. Walpole, lessons read by the Reverend Chancellor Whitaker, and a sermon preached by the Reverend Canon Mason. Carols were sung at intervals by the choir, Mr. Mitchell officiating at the organ. The cathedral was crowded, many nonconformists as well as churchgoers being present. Nonconformists as well as churchgoers being present. Something unique was starting, unbeknownst to them, a tradition that we still celebrate and enjoy today. So we flash back to King's College, to Eric Milner White, and he was himself a liturgical innovator, but he also valued the old, what had come before. You know, and as well as the, the famous festival of lessons and carols that we're talking about tonight, he also developed other services for other times of the year, devising an Advent carol service for King's in 1934, an epiphany procession for York, where he was the dean from 1941 to 63. The other thing about Milner White was he was known especially for his composition of prayers, the beauty of language that he would use. And so one of the famous prayers that he used, it's called the bidding prayer, is traditionally offered after the opening singing of Once in Royal David City. And just hear the beauty and the resonance of these words. Listen, beloved in Christ, be it this Christmas Eve our care and delight to prepare to hear again the message of the angels, in heart and mind to go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, and with the Magi adore the child lying in his mother's arms. And a later passage let us remember before God all those who rejoice with us, but upon another shore and in a greater light, reminding of us of his presence of mind, of those events that had just happened, the war ending. Now, the words of the service were of paramount importance to him. Its liturgical order and pattern, Milner Wright wrote, is the strength of the service. The main theme is the development of the loving purpose of God from the creation to the incarnation through the windows of the chapel, as well as the words of the Bible. The scriptures, not the carols, are the backbone. The music responds to the words. And so one of the chief tasks for successive directors of music has been to select from the vast repertory of carols those which properly reflect what has just been read in the lessons. These lessons have remained virtually unchanged since 1918, though sometimes placed in a slightly different order. 
And so let's go through those lessons for just a moment so you know which ones are there. The first lesson comes from Genesis, where God tells sinful Adam that he's lost the life of, in paradise and that a seed will bruise the serpent's head. The second lesson also comes from Genesis. God promises to faithful Abraham that in his seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. We then jump ahead to the prophecy language of Isaiah, the third lesson foretelling the coming of the Savior. And then the fourth lesson, the promise that the peace that Christ will bring is foreshown. We then move ahead to the actual Christmas story, going into Luke, where the angel Gabriel comes to greet the Blessed Virgin Mary. And continuing in Luke, we hear how Luke tells us the birth of Christ. This is the passage traditionally read on Christmas Eve. The seventh lesson continues on from that same story of the shepherds going to the manger. We then move over to the Gospel of Matthew, where the wise men are led by the star to find the baby Jesus. And then the program culminates with the ninth lesson, the very famous Gospel of John opening where God, excuse me, where John unfolds the great mystery of the Incarnation. Now what are carols? Well, the best resource really to talk about that um, comes out of the Oxford Book of Carols. This was published in 1928. Uh, Percy Dermer actually is one of the editors and wrote an extensive preface in which he talks about this very subject. Carols are songs with a religious impulse that are simple, hilarious, popular, and modern. What an opening sentence. They're generally spontaneous and direct in expression, and their simplicity of form causes them sometimes to ramble on like a ballad. Carol literature and music are rich in true folk poetry and remain fresh and buoyant even when the subject is a grave one. But they vary a good deal. Some are narrative, some dramatic, some personal, a few are secular. And there are some which do not possess all the typical characteristics. Simplicity, for instance, was often lost in the conceits of Jacobian poets who yet wrote some charming carols. Hilarity also has been sometimes forgotten or obscured in the text. The word carol has a dancing origin and once meant to dance in a ring. It may go back through the old French caroler and the Latin Koralula to the Greek Koraluless, a flute player for chorus dancing, and ultimately to the Koros, which was originally a circling dance and the origin of the Attic drama. The carol, in fact, by forsaking the timeless contemplative melodies of the church, began the era of modern music, which has throughout been based upon the dance. But nonetheless, Joyfulness in the words has sometimes been discarded by those who were professionally afraid of gaiety. Some French carols were rewritten by well-meaning clergymen into frigid expositions of edifying theology. Some of the English tunes were used by excellent Methodists of the 18th century to preach their favorite doctrines. Before their time, the British tendency to lugubriousness had occasionally shown itself in the folk carol. But even in such cases, the dancing tunes remained, happily to belie the words. And in French, behind the ecclesiastical propriety of modern Noels, there lurk many carols that bear witness to the spirit of a more spontaneous and undoubting faith. Dermer continues, the typical carol gives voice to the common emotions of healthy people in language that can be understood and music that can be shared by all. Because it is popular, it is therefore genial as well as simple. 
It dances because it is so Christian, echoing St. Paul's conception of the fruits of the Spirit in its challenge to be merry. Love and joy come to you. Indeed, to take life with real seriousness is to take it joyfully, for seriousness is only sad when it is superficial. The carol is thus all the nearer to the ultimate truth because it is jolly. So, on the one hand, the genius of Carol is an antidote to the levity of much present-day literature, music, and drama made by men who are afraid to touch the deeper issues of life because seriousness is associated in their minds with gloom. For its jubilant melodies can encircle the most solemn of themes. On the other hand, it is an antidote to Phariseeism, the formalism which is always morose. As Paul Sabatier says in his life of Francis of Assisi, that most Christians of saints who as the scenic artist at the Greccio crib and as a sweet-voiced troubadour of the Holy Spirit, the joculator Dei was the precursor, if not the parent of the carol. Carols, moreover, were always modern, expressing the manner in which the ordinary man at his best understood the ideas of his age and bringing traditional conservative religion up to date. The carol did this for the 15th century after the collapse of the old feudal order and should do the same for the 20th. The charm of an old carol lies precisely in its having been true to the period in which it was written, and those which are alive today retain their vitality because of this sincerity. For imitations are always sickly and short-lived. A genuine carol may have faults of grammar, logic, prosody, but one fault it never has, that of sham antiquity. I love how the English write such language. And part of what was happening at the time of this publication is this is coming at an era in England that's reacting to the stodgy Victorian ways of the 19th century. Now, also involved in the uh, assembling, the creation of this book are our Rayfon Williams, who you know uh, my name as composer, but also worked extensively in hymnody, English hymnody, and reviving English folk music and capturing that. And then the other person involved in authorship of this book is Martin Shaw. Martin Shaw, whose name you probably recognize from his lighter fair anthem with a voice of singing, that's still a staple in the chor choral repertoire. And so again, they're working to shift music in the church and so I read one more passage to you, um, reflecting the opinions that can only be put in such an English burn. The carol, in fact, was still in jeopardy 50 years ago, and even later. Our churches were flooded with music inspired by the sham Gothic of their renovated interiors. Carol services are indeed not infrequently held, even today, at which not a single genuine carol is sung. On this bad music, let us quote Sir Henry Haddow and have done with it. He writes in his little book, Church Music, published in 1926, there's probably been no form of any art in the history of the world which has been so overrun by the unqualified amateur as English church music from about 1850 to about 1900. Ouch. Many of our professional musicians at this time stood also at a low level of culture and intelligence and were quite content to flow with the stream. Thirty years ago, we were perhaps at our lowest ebb. This music was deplorably easy to write. It required little or no skill in performance. It passed by mere use and want into the hearts of the congregation. It became a habit like any other. And it is only during comparatively recent years that any serious attempts 
have been made to eradicate it. Quite a polite yet harsh critique of a mantle that they're inheriting and yet trying to change. It always reminds me of that phrase, the church is always one generation from extinction. And so it's always calls upon us to keep looking back, but continuing to look forward, to evolve, to change, and to grow. So let's flash back now to King's College and a little history behind it. In the 1400s, the chapel was founded by Henry VI. He instituted daily prayers to be happening there. And Henry ordained that in the family of kings, that there should always be 16 boys to sing with the choral scholars of the college, the College of Grown Men undergraduates. Now, the actual service, as I said earlier, uh, began in 1918. There were slight modifications made in 1919 to continue to build on the flow of the service. And what really enhanced its popularity and made it known was when they began working with the BBC in 1928 to broadcast that service. And if you fast forward to 1954, that was the first televised service sent out to the world in which you'll see, uh, have a video to share with you of 13 boys uh, beginning to enter the space. And you see the different singers gathering from their different areas of where they were vesting, putting on their robes and getting ready. And the choir processes during the end of an organ prelude to the center of the church. And that very famous boy solo starts the service you know, with the iconic once in royal David City. And you'll hear during the second stanza, the choir processes, processes forward singing a cappella. And then the most scariest moment for any choral conductor is that third stanza when the organ then comes in to validate the pitch. So enjoy this video from 1954, the first televised service of a festival of lessons and carols. The Crucifer and Choristers enter the antechapel, the nave in King's College Chapel here in Cambridge. A college founded by Henry VI who ordained that in the family of kings there should always be 16 boys to sing as choristers with the grown men. And when, in a few moments time, one of these choristers reads the first lesson, you will see surmounting the lectern a small bronze figure of the king who laid the first stone of this chapel just over 500 years ago. The Crucifer and Choristers, joined now by the Choral Scholars, full undergraduate members of the college, and members too of one of the great choirs of the world. And now follow the chaplain, the two deans, clerical and lay, who are responsible for the conduct of the services, and the vice provost. And finally, preceded by a chapel clerk bearing the mace, comes the head of the college, the provost.
you can actually find the entire video from 1954 on YouTube uh, by searching King's College uh, Christmas. I encourage you to watch it. It's about a 50 minute video. Uh, it actually includes portions of the Christmas oratorio where they use recitative leading up to break forth, O beauteous heavenly light. Uh, some famous English carols, of course, in dulce jubilo. And then a hymn that you may not know, it's very English, while shepherds watch their flocks, but can be found actually in our hymnal as well. So we move forward now to the lineage of organist, director, or music roles. Uh, similar to many programs or institutions um, that have nationally regarded, there tend to be long tenures by these folks in these roles. Um, part of it provides stability, the other part of it is it establishes a tradition. And each one of the folks who have conducted at King's came through the school at some point. So we start with uh, Arthur Henry Mann, who uh, was at King's College from 1876 until 1929, a long tenure indeed. Uh, he's particularly known uh, for a very famous hymn tune called Angel's Story, which he originally wrote for the text, I Love to Hear the Story. But as we know that tune today, we hear it to the text, O oh Jesus, I have promised. Now, when I think about that, 53 years is a long time. But part of the, the importance of that length of tenure is uh, Arthur Henry Mann is generally the one giving credit for transforming the quality of the chapel choir at King's from the worst of the three in Cambridge that maintain daily chorus, choral services to the most famous Anglican choir in the world. That reference can be found in the New Grove Dictionary. How did he do this? Well, first he persuaded the college to establish a choir school, and then he gradually began replacing the lay clerks with choral scholars. So he moved from uh, amateur singers into students, undergraduate students, who were studying at the college, specifically music. And this enabled him to completely change the trajectory of the program. Boris Ord then took over in 1929 and his tenure was not nearly as long, but it was very impactful. Uh, he was there for 28 years until 1957. And so he came with the title of organist. Um, and one of the unique features of his time there was he had an organ scholar whose name you will know. And that would be David Wilcox. David Wilcox came as a teenager to study at King's. Now, one of the traits that you'll see as we move further down the lineage of conductors is they were all composers or arrangers. At bare minimum, they were arranging carols. Some of them also composed original music. And all of them have achieved fame for that. The one piece that we really know Boris Ord for is his setting that's often used after the first lesson, Adam Lay Bounden. And so we'll take a moment to hear this short piece.
That was Boris Ord's Adam Leigh Bounden from the 1954 first televised concert. Now, during Boris Ord's tenure, a reminder of the dates of that, 1929 to 1957, um, happened two things. One, there was uh, a brief pause of one year when they could not televise the program, but two, World War II happened. And despite World War II happening, they continued to broadcast these services. Now, one of the interesting features of that time is they removed the glass from the windows of the chapel to protect it in case they were bombed. And then they also did not provide any identifying characteristics of the broadcast on the BBC to make sure they didn't identify that there were people in the building when the service was happening. Now, Boris Ord was actually enlisted into the army, and so was David Wilcox at that time. And so another name that you might recognize, probably recognize, uh, substituted for Boris Ord from 1940 to 1945, and that was Harold Dark. Harold Dark was also a student uh, at King's, and at age 18, during this time where he's substituting, is when he arranged his version of In the Bleak Midwinter that we all love today and still sing. And it was first performed under Dark's direction during this interim time. Now, Boris Ord came back um, from the war, as did David Wilcox, to return to their positions and carried on from 1945 forward. And it was during this time that as Boris Ord's health began to deteriorate that they actually split the titles of organist and director of music. Boris Ord maintained that director of music title while David Wilcox was retained as the organist. And he continued in this arrangement until Boris Ord retired in 1957. And it was at this point that David Wilcox, they put the title back together and he assumed the role of director of music organist at King's. Of course, you know David Wilcox's name very well, uh, an incredible output of arrangements, of hymn settings, the iconic descants to O Come All Ye Faithful and Hark the Herald, as well as both original composition and his own arrangements. A highly productive and active composer, um, both for this as well as, as well as throughout the region. And ultimately, when he left King's, it was to continue to build on his compositional work and to you know, conduct at other uh, venues, such as the Three Choirs and be part of Birmingham. He was doing cl guest clinician, uh, also working with the Royal School of Church Music. A prolific career, prolific energy, who elevated this program yet to another level. And so how do you follow that? Philip Ledger comes in, again, a product of King's and the tradition. And at one of his early rehearsals, uh, he had written his own descants for Hark the Herald and O Come All Ye Faithful. And he received protests that he recalls in a video interview from the chorus of saying, these are not the right descants for these hymns. And Ledger has a moment where how do I, this is my worst fear, how do I respond to this? And fortunately, another chorister comes to his rescue and says, well, at King's, this is a tradition that the music director writes the descants for the carols. Ledger was off the hook, relieved, and carried on the tradition of composer, composing and arranging for this very famous service. In 1982, Stephen Cleoberry then comes into this role, again, another King's student. And one of the things that Stephen Cleoberry introduces as a tradition of King's is the annual uh, commissioning of a carol, an anthem, sometimes multiple, for the, for the services. And out of this engages um, a new heritage of English composers, the forefront of whom is John Rutter. Um, John Rutter is featured extensively early on, has a massive compositional output. Uh, we spend more time on John Rutter's music next Tuesday uh, with a special presentation by the Choral Scholars. 
But there was also, uh, as we come forward in time, Alan Bullard, Malcolm Archer, the list is lengthy. As a new output of repertoire is put forward, but still the traditions of what was sung early on is still utilized. Part of that is the practical of when you're teaching 16 boys about the age of 12, you know, it's helpful to have a set repertoire, but at the same time, Cleoberry is trying to press forward and continue to develop and evolve the, for today. What are the current trends happening with English composers? Cleoberry was also a prolific uh, ranger. Uh, one of the CDs I have of his in my personal collection, I love listening to each year, that features his hymn harmonizations as well as descants uh, on also his own arrangements of carols as well. A particular note is his arrangement of Silent Night. Now Cleoberry planned a retirement uh, to happen in 2019. It was during that time that Daniel Hyde was appointed into that role. Uh, Daniel Hyde was the, again, a King's College uh, singer, came through the educational program there was actually an organ scholar for Stephen Cleoberry, and was actually up at St. Thomas, New York City, running the choir school there, and also organist. And he had only been there three years when the call came in to return back to King's. Sadly, Cleoberry's health declined, and he passed away, and brought, it forced Daniel Hyde to actually start early, uh, conducting the 2019 uh, Festival of Lessons and Carols. It will be fascinating to watch what his stamp is and what direction he takes that program moving forward. So let's jump over to the music. Um, again, coming out of the Oxford Books of Carols, uh, Percy Dermer classifies it this way. But a mixture of musical genres and styles is an important element in the service's appeal. This mix has covered at least the five categories found in the Oxford Book of Carols. One, traditional carols with tunes proper to them, in some cases foreign carols with traditional words translated. For example, a virgin most pure, you know, Noel, sing we now all and some, words in music, medieval. Uh, King Jesus here garden, excuse me, King Jesus hath a garden, and so these are adapted and modified. Two, traditional carol tunes set to other traditional or old texts, like angels from the realms of glory. Three, modern texts written for or adapted to traditional tunes. O little town of Bethlehem, traditional words, but the tune that we use in America is not the one that they would use in England. They use the hymn tune Forest Green, one of their famous folk melodies. Four, traditional carols, some by old writers, but set to tunes by modern composers. You just heard an example of that previously. Adam Le Bounden, uh, 15th, 5th century, excuse me, 15th century uh, words, you know, set to music by Boris Ord. And lastly, carols by modern writers and composers. So one star, at last, is an example. The words by George Mackey Brown, born in 1921. The composer Peter Maxwell Davies, born in 1934. So we're going to jump off again for a moment and hear one of these carol arrangements. And I remind you of the words of, of, of Dermer from earlier about... Um, the hilarity, the lightful, the joyfulness, the sometimes secular nature of carols and the importance of them as we enjoy this next one. Oh, 
Peace. Who would imagine going into a service and hearing, I saw three ships, and especially sung by a boy choir in a cathedral? That's one of the challenges of the more fast, virtuosic music, is trying to find clarity in the music. And the composers talk about, while there's, excuse me, the conductors, while they talk about how they love the resonance and the space, also how it changes when 1,400 people then come and sit within it. And so the challenges of producing a clean recording. So there, as I referenced earlier, there's mu there are music staples that are consistently used throughout the program, both in the carol repertoire that continues to be um, reused as part of their tradition, also out of the practicality of education of the new boys who are coming in uh, to the program. And there's some things that are very difficult to change. You know, the once in Royal David City, iconic. I don't think any conductor would dare touch that. It's been going on uh, for over 100 years. As I spoke about earlier, the challenges of uh, replacing the, you know, the descants that are all synonymous with the hymns by David Wilcox of Hark the Herald, Angels Sing, and O Come All Ye Faithful. And yet, you know, the same thing also happened where there's pre-service and post-service music. And it's interesting, when you look at the programs, you see very set pieces that tend to take those places. Whether it's the pastoral symphony from the Bach Christmas Oratorio, or uh, the pastoral symphony from Messiah by Handel, um, the canonic variations on von Himmel Hock, From Heaven Above to Earth I Come by J.S. Bach. Interestingly enough, they also lean on the music of Olivier Messiaen. Again, to our modern ears, um, it's the similar harmony to jazz harmony, but it takes a while for the ears to adapt to it. But they play multiple movements out of his setting of the nativity. Bach chorales, preludes are a natural part of it. Uh, the very difficult and challenging variations uh, on a Noel by Marcel Dupre, the virtuosic French organist. Incredible piece of music and incredibly difficult to play. And yet they also jump back to Buxta de Huda, you know, the early Baroque composer and his setting of In Dulce Jubilo. And so the challenge of this program, both in the choral side, also falls on the organ scholar that supports that program because the repertoire that's demanded is definitely recital repertoire in one of the most challenging performances. So I want to leave you tonight with a couple of scenes uh, from the Lessons and Carols. The unique atmosphere of the candlelit chapel at Christmas is most keenly felt by those who queue to attend. There are no tickets. A few hardy people usually arrive on December 23rd, but those arriving by 10 a.m. can usually be sure of gaining admittance. 
Inside, there is much to occupy the attention as they wait for the boy choir solo to begin once in Royal David City. As the organ scholar plays Christmas music, they can reflect on the aptness of the chapel's dedication to Our Lady and St. Nicholas. They can look in wonder at the stained glass windows, which contain pictures of the Annunciation and the birth of our Lord, as well as depictions of Joachim and Anna, the parents of Mary, at the golden gate of the temple, and the birth of Mary and her marriage to Joseph. These latter events, part of an old tradition of Christmas stories still current in the time of Henry VIII when the glass was made, had not been included in the Bible. They were brought to life by M.R. James, who knew that chapel glass intimately. And those fortunate enough to be in the main part of the chapel will be able to gaze on Reuben's adoration of the Magi. Appropriately, it was Eric Milner White returning to address the governing body in 1961 at the age of 77, who was an important voice in urging the fellows to accept it and place it behind the high altar. There, with the child Jesus at its heart, it reminds us of the true center of Christmas. As the program culminates with that Gospel of John reading, I want to share part of that with you, and then a brief reflection. I believe it's from the 2000 service and presented by the provost um, at that time. So from the Gospel of John, we hear these famous words, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness shall not overcome it. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, fool of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. And she writes, since John explains that if we are to be guided by the light that shone from the stable of Bethlehem, then we must live in love to all. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness. And sure unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard, declare me unto you, that he may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This thing is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. Do not tell the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. 
and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Thanks be to God. And so as we close tonight's program, I have one more anthem to share with you. But first I want to share with you the poetry uh, so you hear the context of what's happening. But this is a poem based on the shepherds uh, seeing the light and being called to find that manger. The poem is by Clive Sampson. We stood on the hills, lady, our day's work done, watching the frosted meadows that winter had won. The evening was calm, lady, the air so still, silence more lovely than music folded the hill. There was a star, lady, shone in the night, larger than Venus it was and bright, so bright. Oh, a voice from the sky, lady, it seemed to us then telling of God being born in the world of men. And so we have come, lady, our day's work done, our love, our hopes, ourselves, we give to your son.
Thank you for joining me for tonight's look back on a history of a festival of lessons and carols. It's made famous by King's College, Cambridge. I hope you've learned a few things from that presentation. And I encourage you to join us in the next couple of weeks as each of the Tuesdays continue to propel us forward to Christmas. Uh, next week, you'll hear the choral scholars present a, a program of anthems and carols as arranged and composed by John Rutter. And then the following weeks, we'll continue to hear more Christmas anthems and then a program of carols featuring the quartet, which will lead us to our own celebration of Christmas at Wayne. So thank you for being here tonight. God bless you, and good night.